Now, I don't really feel the need to repeat myself, because as I'm sure if you've been watching my channel for a while now, then you know I bring up one particular point when it comes to any game that tasted the slightest bit of success. And that is that either the company itself or anybody else wants to capitalize on said success. But one aspect I never really mentioned on when discussing that topic were spin-offs. Yes, in a lot of franchises' case, games that originally were under the umbrella of one genre tended to want to branch out and explore new ventures to hopefully reach a wider audience that perhaps wasn't all too interested in the original genre said IP originated from. And while some of these ventures were met with great success, others... <laughs> Not so much. Yes, enough beating around the bush, ladies and gentlemen. Whether you're looking at an obese plumber that never does said plumbing, instead chasing after a woman that's more into scalies than Joseph Stalin, to a blue hedgehog that's fan base really loves him, to an orange bandicoot that's got the amount of cognitive functionality as a US president. Where all three of these franchises started out as 2D and 3D platformers, their success landed them perfectly into expansion into different genres. All three of them went on to star in their very own racing games, party games and game genres they normally wouldn't be associated with like RPGs or beat-em-ups. And these three franchises are just three in countless examples of games that went on to star in their very own kinds of spin-offs. So one game franchise that hasn't really budged all that much from its original genre and remained pretty consistent throughout its life is the indie horror genre's favorite cash cow, Five Nights at Freddy's. Yes, since it's the Bears 10th anniversary, which I covered on a retrospective video not too long ago that none of you watched, so shame on you. It seems that to celebrate this occasion, we were graced by two official games under the FNAF brand. The first of which being Five Nights at Freddy's Into the Pit, an adaptation of a pretty beloved book in the franchise, and one that I beat recently. Thanks so much to T-Pain Cat for the review code. And also alongside that game, a demo for an upcoming racing game called Five Laps at Freddy's. Now why this game is confusing to me is, well the obvious, as well as the fact that we all know FNAF is probably one of, if not the biggest face in indie horror, and horror in general. But with a franchise as large as this, I'm genuinely surprised it took over a decade to get an official spin-off title like this. I mean, of course there were fan-made games, and Scott did create FNAF World, which was probably the first time the series branched off into a completely different genre, and I guess Pizzeria Sim counts too, but that game was still primarily a horror game. But a racing game containing all the beloved characters we've all grown to know and love and happily piss ourselves when they decide to speak at an unreasonably high decibel seem like it would be a no-brainer. But let's do a little bit of a sidetrack here for a second. Hey, almost like when a car veers off the racetrack. I am so funny with my puns. I should start a YouTube channel. A little thing that I tend to do before I take a crack at playing a video game or making a video on said game is sometimes I tend to do a little bit of research. The thing a lot of us hated doing in school but is a damn near necessity if you don't want to look like an ass on the internet. Not that I've succeeded at avoiding such scrutiny. But regardless, before I wanted to start playing, I wanted to know what I was getting myself into. And what I was met with was... Oh. Oh. Ah. I'm starting to think that this game got as warm of a welcome as the Borderlands movie. So being a YouTuber that is in no way afraid to share his distaste on a game, for better or for worse, I just got even more and more excited to play this game. And I did. On stream, in fact. I'll link the full VOD in the description below if you want my full unfiltered thoughts on the game. But this negative reception still piqued my curiosity. How the hell do you mess up a simple kart racing game featuring characters who would be more inclined to traumatize a generation than to cause fond memories? It's not like the concept of a shitty racing game doesn't exist. I mean, we got the obvious culprits like Big Rigs Over the Road Racing, Flat Out 3, Yaris, and... M&M's card racing. And whilst I'm not too sure if these games are really bad, just more shovelware games like Garfield Kart, Madagascar, and DreamWorks Kart, and other examples like that, how hard could it really be to mess up a FNAF racing game? Surely since this is the funny bear's 10th birthday and his first foray in the same genre where it's not as frowned upon to drive with your eyes closed and mildly intoxicated, it couldn't be that bad, right? Oh, how wrong I was. But let's get some history out of the way first. So this is something that I found quite interesting. The game was both developed and published by Click Team, the company that owns the engine that Scott used to actually create the original FNAF games and many others in the franchise. So having the actual people who owns the engine responsible for creating this franchise seemed quite poetic in a weird sort of way. But then all this magic is lost when you learn that the game was developed using Unreal Engine 4. I mean, 
mean, that sort of makes sense, right? Click Team Fusion mostly requires you to... Click, so I don't exactly know how well that would translate over into a racing game. But I already kind of found this to be a red flag. How is a company that primarily created an engine for point and click games going to make a fully 3D racing game on a completely different engine? But I've rambled for long enough. I'm no fucking furry clickbait raccoon. So let's actually jump in and see what this game is like. So upon loading the game up, we're immediately thrusted into the main menu. There's a cart, there's the game's title, there's the same hilltops from Fortnite, and there's a garage that I hope you aren't wandering in the dead of night because you might be met with a good Birmingham welcome. Here are our three options, only two of which are going to be useful, that being new game and the exit game button. And here are our two disclaimers that tell us we shouldn't be too harsh on their game because it isn't done yet. You sure came to the wrong channel, my friend. Ooh. But in any case, let's click on new game and see what lies beyond the outside of this fine motor establishment. So upon clicking new game, we get immediately thrusted into the character select screen where we're met with these cute yet uncanny versions of Freddy Fazbear and the rest of the gang in this weird, chibi yet not so chibi art style uh, regardless, Freddy looking all perked up and happy to see us and giving us the tip of the hat like he's about to tie us to cinder blocks and drop us into the Marianas Trench. Bonnie looking like he's just woken up after a fan or jorking sesh. Chica looking like she wants your phantom tax and the fact that I just said that maybe Freddy should just end me. Foxy looking like he's posing for a Twitter artist to do with him as they please. The puppet just looking happy to be here. Same with Mangle. Balloon Boy seeming like he wishes for all the pain to end and Springtrap looking like he's the only guy aware of what people think about this game. So with that in mind, I obviously picked him. But before we move on, a thing that I'm rather confused with is the fact that every single character seems to have their own specific class. What this class means exactly, I have absolutely no idea. Does it mean their speed, handling, likelihood to murder a child? I'm not too sure. Though, saying that last theory, the fact that Springtrap and Mangle's classes are both maxed out, I'm starting to think that my theory isn't too far-fetched at all. Anyway, after selecting your character, you're then allowed to pick one of three different cards. You have your bog standard go kart, you have the cup kart themed after Mr. Cupcake, or as I like to call it, the diabetes mobile, and finally, the most fan favorite vehicle I can imagine is the Midnight Motor from the popular FNAF 6 minigame where William Afton decides to go drunk driving on his way back from McDonald's. After selecting what vehicle you want, we're then allowed to select one of three tracks. We have Fazbear Hills, a completely original track for this game, Midnight Motorist, a 3D rendition on FNAF 6's minigame, and finally the sinkhole being themed after FNAF Security Breach's underground segment. I should also mention that there are two locked modes aside from your box standard races, one of which I can make out and the other probably just being a time trial mode, so let's just say we aren't really that spoiled for choice. But with all of the formalities out of the way, let's start finally talking about the game. We get our swooping flyby shots of the track we're about to race on, see all the other races on the track, hear V1 Ultra Kill Countdown, and then the race finally starts. And at first glance, what the flying fuck are these controls? Yes, now I'm pretty sure Click Team must be situated somewhere in Europe because these are some foreign controls if I've ever seen any. So let's get a load of this because this game's control scheme basically writes the jokes for themselves. So to accelerate you need to press left trigger, reversing and braking is the left bumper, drift for whatever reason is on the right trigger, and at the very least they got the boost button right. I don't know who the hell thought that this would be a good control scheme for a racing game when a million other games got it down almost three decades ago, but whatever. I fixed the controls to my liking and then I was somewhat able to play. I say somewhat because because I feel like I'm driving a car that's busy being pushed back by a bulldozer with how heavy everything feels, and when I veer off track, I might as well have gotten myself stuck in cement because it took forever to get out. But before I go on further with my complaints, what is the goal in... <laughs> Laugh. Well, if you've actually played a racing game, then good for you, you can leave now. But yeah, that's basically it. You go throughout all these different tracks trying to get into first place. That's pretty much it. But seeing that this is a kart racing game, it's a little bit more interesting than the games where you race in cars neither me or you will be able to afford in our lifetime. Because scattered throughout the maps, you can get a bunch of different power-ups that can either be used offensively or defensively. Namely, in this game's case, the ones that I found anyway, Mr. 
monster cupcake which acts like a mushroom in Mario Kart, giving you a boost of speed, a rocket that acts like what I'm assuming is the red shells from Mario Kart where homes onto other enemies, a bomb that causes AoE damage to yourself or anybody else that's caught in its vicinity, a laser gun which is the green shell variant in this game, being a laser bolt that ricochets off different surfaces until it hits its desired target, a magnet that I assume makes you appreciate the art that went into it because I sure as hell couldn't find out what this thing did, fries which are not only a health hazard if you consume too much, but in this game's case acts like a banana peel with you slipping on its grease, a mirror that covers you in a bunch of glass shards, so I'm assuming that this acts at both as an offensive and defensive shield, and lastly what I thought was the tablet from the first FNAF game, but I was extremely mistaken, fake fan I realize, but this is actually the shutter door from the first FNAF game, which blocks the road and causes you and other vehicles to crash if you collide into it. Other than those power ups, there are also these two pickups that you can also get your hands on, which one of which increases the size of your boost gauge, and the other one I'm gonna assume acts like the Wumpa Fruit and CTR just increasing your car's base speed, though I'm not too sure about that. When it comes to your actual character control here, you're able to do the basics of any other kart racing game. You can accelerate, you can brake, you can drift, you can jump, you know, the basics. And in this game specifically, you also have access to a boost at all times that you can fill up by completing successful drifts or running through these panels that recharge the gauge. And that's pretty much the basics of what this game has. Now you might be wondering to yourself, well, that just sounds like any other car racing game on the market, so what does this game do to help it stand out from amongst the crowd? Well, two things actually. It remembers what franchise it's from. Oh no, I've done shitted myself. And takes inspiration from a game you wouldn't expect, and that being Sonic 06. That being that the game doesn't work. <laughs> I gotta put the uh, display capture on. Fatal error. The Unreal Engine flat game crash. Oh no. Let's start with the former though. The one standout thing that I actually really like in this game is that after a certain amount of time has passed, the game will go into what it calls the night shift. And once that happens, the entire world changes around you into this hellish nightmare scape that I'm pretty sure pays homage to those VR sections in FNAF Ruin. This doesn't really do anything to the stage itself except visually. However, once you head into the night shift, you're going to be pursued by this OC which is indicated by this icon at the top of your character's head, and when it reaches you, it jump scares you, causing you to stand still for a little bit, giving the other racers a chance to overtake you. There's also this three section red bar that shows up at the top of your screen, and I for the life of me can't tell for shit what this is supposed to mean. Is this what tells you your likelihood of getting jumped, how fast your patience is running out? I'm not too sure. And moving on to the latter now. And another fatal fucking error! Okay, hang on, I need two of these. Yeah, there you go. Another time. There we go. Everybody in chat is my witness. This game crashed on me two times on the same fucking map. Awesome. Yes, after just starting to play the game, I can already start to see where other YouTubers were coming from when they said that this game is glitchy and unplayable. While saying the game is unplayable is definitely stretching it a little bit, I'll explain why later, your cards just feel so heavy and unnatural to control. And one of the major reasons for this is that your card is just a little bit too responsive. When you hit the brake, you'll come into almost an immediate standstill like you actually care not to hit a deer in the middle of the road. And when it comes to drifting, which is the primary thing that you're going to need to use in order to turn corners way easier and to build up your boost gauge, holding that drift in for too long or pushing too far on the control stick will cause you to make a damn U-turn screwing yourself over like a motherfucker. And if the carts themselves aren't handling like shit, whenever you do stuff you're not supposed to do, that being going off track or colliding with any part of said track, you're almost extremely likely to come to a fucking stop when you go off the road or you'll be so magnetized to whatever part of the wall you hit, you can practically sign up for a divorce by the time you get unstuck. This shit happened to me way more times than I'm comfortable to admit, and I needed to restart entire races just to get my bearings and try to get used to the game's controls. And that also doesn't really help because the fact that the game doesn't have a reset position option or an option just to restart the race. So either you hope you're able to recover fast enough so you can catch up again, or you're just going to have to restart the race by heading back to 
to the main menu, reselecting your character card and map just to repeat the cycle and hope that new bullshit doesn't happen to you during your next race. But that alone isn't the sole reason why I say this game doesn't work. Because if you paid attention to the clip that I put in for everybody, this game crashed on me not only once, but twice. And the most annoying thing out of everything is the fact that the game can just bug out and just flat out refuse to let you finish a race. This primarily happened to me on the sinkhole map, which I suppose is fitting. The game that this map is based off of wasn't exactly known for being the best behaved either. Now what I mean by this is the following. Your car can either get stuck on the walls of the map, magnetize on this section of the map, making you think that the car itself got bit by a radioactive spider, or even if you're able to get yourself unstuck from the wall, the game is just gonna spawn you back to the last checkpoint because it sure as fuck doesn't seem to realize that I'm okay and I'm able to move forward. What kind of shit is this? Yeah, no, I think this game takes the cake of not just being one of the worst games in this franchise, but also one of the worst racing games I personally ever played. And the community seems to genuinely agree with that. But why? Well, I think there's an obvious answer to all of this. This game was just rushed out of the gate. And said rushing, I think, is no surprise to coincide with the 10th anniversary of FNAF. This demo did come out an entire day before it, after all. But what I find hilarious is that the full game is only going to release next year. So why release a buggy, unfinished demo that's putting more of a sour taste in people's mouth than excitement? And what sucks about this the most is that I can see a good game in here, because when everything thing work as I'm sure the devs intended, it's actually pretty fun to keep that momentum going and try to win each race. And with some more polish and content, I can at the very least say that I think by the time this game actually comes out, it can be a decent to good racing game featuring your favorite FNAF characters. But for what we have right now, this is a game that I definitely think you should pass on. But hey, at the very least, not all was lost on this beloved franchise 10th anniversary, and I'll be sure to cover why that is in the next video. Warning. This video may or may not contain spoilers. I'm not sure yet, but I'm putting this here because it's funny. Now, if you watched my video covering FNAF's impact on horror, then you may remember at the end of the video, a thing that I was really upset about is how FNAF basically fed into the mascot horror genre it indirectly helped create. And I thought that that really sucked. You went from a franchise that me and countless other players can say is one of the scariest games we've ever played to verbal aces furry fetish. I was genuinely worried like hell that FNAF would go down the same route as those games. But thankfully, I was wrong. Because not long after the release of FNAF Security Breach, we've gotten its free DLC Ruin. Which not being nearly as good as the original games in the series, you can definitely see they were trying to return back to its roots with this game. And after that, we got the sequel to the beloved VR entry to this franchise, Help Wanted 2. And from what I've heard people say, they actually really love this game too. And another game that just seemingly came out of nowhere was a little game called Five Nights at Freddy's Into the Pit. Originally being revealed at Gorilla Collective 2024, this pixel art style game set in the FNAF universe immediately caught my eye for completely shallow reasons, of course, Paul Robertson is one of my favorite pixel art artists, but the tone and gameplay style seemed more akin to older style survival horror games like Silent Hill and Resident Evil, only this time with a higher emphasis on avoiding this yellow fursuit instead of fighting it head on. But if you're anything like me, then you might be thinking to yourself, this seems like a random departure from the main games in the series. Who is this kid? Where does this game take place in the timeline? Why is Spring Bonnie into Vore? All of these questions were just burned into my skull, and I needed to get to the bottom of it. So digging a little bit deeper to try and find out what Into the Pit was, it opened up an entire different can of worms. So allow me to explain what I mean. So with the franchise's biggest FNAF, I think it's safe to say that it spanned throughout all different forms of media. Obviously through the games, YouTube videos, music, and a thing that I shudder to even think about. Books. Yes, with the franchise as lore-rich as Five Nights at Freddy's, it is ripe for adaptations into novels and fan fictions. Whether it takes place in the main continuity of the franchise or a completely different story within the universe of the games. And fuck me, FNAF has got a shit ton of different books. If going off of what the FNAF wiki is saying, there's a total of 72 books set in the FNAF universe. Now, just for reference, that's more books than Lord of the Rings, 
Harry Potter, Game of Thrones, not so much Star Wars, but still, a game franchise that primarily makes you sit in one spot hoping that you're not gonna become part of someone's deviant art fetish. Being able to span so many different written media is definitely commendable. And while scouring throughout this extensive list of reading material that may or may not have caused its fair share of deforestation, you'll stumble upon it. Fazbear Frights Volume 1, Into the Pit. And yes, this book seems to be the first volume into an entire franchise in and of itself. But apparently, according to a lot of people, this is a fan favorite book amongst the FNAF community. And if it's worthy enough to be adapted into a video game, then I guess that all kind of makes sense, right? So before we actually get into what the book is, let's talk about the game's devs. The game was both developed and published by Mega Cat Studios, who I will forever continue to make fun of because their splash screen sounded like if a cat stepped on an otter tune machine. <laughs> But regardless, these guys were responsible for making a shit ton of games, most of which I've never heard of before, but looking on their website, they at least made two licensed games, being from Monopoly and Power Rangers, respectively. And they've worked with some pretty massive names like Razor, Sanrio, Mattel, Hasbro, Dell, Nickelodeon, Head Up Games, and Universal. So these guys definitely have a track record. And looking at those two licensed games that they made... Oh... Oh... Own. Looking at some of their original works, like this one here, Sacred Line 1, it seems like they do have an affinity for some unique art styles in their games, and it seems like they've dipped into the realm of horror before. So I at the very least think that this game was in good hands. And hey, judging on what a lot of creators of the platform have to say about it, I'd say that they did a pretty damn good job. But we're not here to give them ad revenue. No, you clicked on this video to hear my thoughts. So let me not waste any more of your time, and let's take a plunge into the ball pit so I can tell you why I think FNAF Into the Pit is amazing. Now for this video, I think I want to try something different for once. I already gave you a spoiler warning at the beginning of the video, so if you don't want to watch the story, skip to this timestamp or click off the video now so that I don't end up ruining anything for you. But if you do that... Please don't, no, I'll be lonely, don't leave me with these guys. But any case, yes, this will be the very first official freakishly long plot summary. I don't really tend to do that for a lot of these games because generally I don't care, but since this game is based off of a book, I think it nailing the story is gonna be one of the most important things. So here we go. The game starts with you, a boy named Oswald, busy living out his dreams of becoming a Twitter artist by drawing characters who we should be very familiar with at this point, but for Oswald, they don't seem to have any correlations to the characters that we love, and the kid wishes that something interesting would happen for a change. His dad calls him down as it's time for them to go somewhere, and in the car, he and his dad share a little exchange talking about the destination his dad is taking him to, as well as some insight into the family and the place where they live. Apparently, Oswald lives in a shithole, a town that's pretty much gone into a downward spiral ever since its mill closed down. Oswald's family seems to be one of those that got hit the hardest by this because they can barely scrape by with what they make. Oswald's dad works part-time at a store hoping to make it full-time, and his mother works long hours as a nurse at the hospital, meaning that Oswald barely ever gets to see her. Oswald wonders why they just can't move away, but it would seem the reason behind this being that his grandmother is extremely frail, so that's not an option, suggesting that they should put her in bubble his dad jokingly scoffs this off with a laugh. Perhaps this child is unaware of the process of airlifting. In any case, during summer vacation, since the family isn't really capable of affording to go on one, Oswald's dad drops him off at a place called Jeff's Pizza, because the pizza there is pretty cheap, and it's a place for Oswald to hang out until his dad comes to fetch him. But apparently Jeff's Pizza is just as big of a shithole as the rest of the town. But it's probably the only place that Oswald can really hang out. Upon getting dropped off at the place, some time passes where Oswald's dad is is late picking him up for what seems to be a few times up until this point. After hearing about a secret ball pit in the pizzeria, Oswald chooses to investigate. After finding it, Oswald thinks it's a good idea to prank his dad by hiding in the pit as to teach him a lesson for leaving him in such a creepy place like this. After jumping into the ball pit that is probably filled to the brim with dust and rat shit, once he decides to come up for air, he's met with a surprisingly full room of kids celebrating and playing. Obviously being confused by this, Oswald chooses to investigate further. After leaving the room, we get to see a pretty enhanced and full pizzeria. And moving to the right of the place, we get to see the cast of characters that we're oh so familiar with, but Oswald has no idea of, aside from them looking like characters he drew in his sketchbook. Moving throughout the pizzeria, we meet these two kids called Mike and Chip. Kids who Oswald ends up making friends with, but not without the overwhelming sense of confusion. After a game of skee-ball with Mike and Chip, the first of which I lost because fuck pixel physics, the kids then decide to play a game of tag, another game of which I 
miserably failed. Because I guess all of the pizza Oswald's been munching is starting to have an impact on his running. After that, the kids then decide to play a game of hide and seek. And after Oswald finds the stupidest fucking place to hide, I'm pretty sure he hasn't seen what happens when you die in the first FNAF game. After Mike finds Chip and leaves the room, the power cuts and then we see our first proper look at Spring Bonnie, as we need to hold our breath to make sure the little shit doesn't find us. After he leaves, all hell breaks loose. The pizzeria erupts into chaos, filled with screams of terror from both adults and children. Oswald decides to investigate to make sure Mike and Chip are alright, and during the panic he sees the animatronics from earlier seem a lot less friendly than when we first arrived. And then after exploring and finding an unlocked door, there he is. Some people just got erect. After him beckoning Oswald to follow him, and for whatever reason Oswald decides to follow him, you know, it kind of contradicts the fact that we were clearly trying to hide from him a few seconds ago, we open the door only to be met with the bodies of five dead children, and spring Bonnie all ready to lunge at us. Fuck you! After running and hiding from the rabbit, we make our escape to the one place that actually transported us to this alternate version of Jeff's Pizza, and that's back to the ball pit. After re-emerging, we're met with Jeff and Oswald's dad waiting for him there, and after his dad comes to reprimand him from hiding, the furry pounces. We think our dad is done for, but we're able to pull him back out. Or so we think. Yeah, in reality, for whatever reason, the rabbit was able to possess Oswald's father, but only he seems to realize it. After the rabbit drives Oswald home, it's here where we need to sneak around the house in order to call Oswald's mother, so she can come and see what's up with his dad. After doing so, and his mom returning home to see that Oswald's dad is completely fine to her, but clearly we and Oswald can see that's definitely not the case, after that we effectively properly start the game. So before I continue onwards with the plot, let's talk a little bit about the entire gameplay loop of Into the Pit. Now, true to the series namesake, the game takes place over a series of five nights, but also five days. Ooh, I don't think you expected that, right? Sadly, I don't think that name would have rolled off the tongue quite so nicely. And during these daytime sections, this is where the game primarily decides to flesh out more of the game's world to give you some breathing room before you decide to tackle the nights. And once nighttime hits, much like how nights are handled in Dying Light, this is where shit officially hits the fan. Nights can primarily be broken down into two primary sections. Sections. First off is trying to escape the house from Oswald's fur suit wearing father because his son is just unaccepting to his dad's new hobby and as a result his father needs to get rid of him before he spills the beans. And the other section being to head back into Freddy's to try and locate where his father might have gone. But things aren't quite that simple because when you head back to the pizzeria on night two, you'll be met with sort of a puzzle before you can complete your mission. At the beginning of night two, you have this child stuck in an animatronic suit and we're set with the task of trying to free them. And in order to do that, we're going to need to get a screwdriver, but since there is no way of accessing the supply room, we seem shit out of luck. Until you realize that we're in an alternate version of Jeff's Pizza, so maybe things that exist in the present day could be used in the past. So this is also one of the biggest aspects to the game, jumping through time using the ball pit to complete puzzles. Like in Night 2, in order to get the screwdriver, we need to go back to the present day to get the key from Jeff so we can open up the supply room. But before that, we need to drop some trash off at the mill in order to get it. Once we complete Complete that task, Jeff hands us the key and we can go back in time through the ball pit to unlock the room, nabbing us the screwdriver. After rescuing the kid, we ask them if they've seen our father, they say no, and just as the conversation ends, Rule 34's second favorite rabbit pops out and we need to escape using the ball pit to end the night. And that's pretty much the entire gameplay loop of Into the Pit. We start out during the daytime so we can get more of the world and characters fleshed out, only for nighttime to fall where we need to escape the house first through ever-changing means, and then head back to the pizzeria to try and gather more more clues as to where Oswald's dad is, and to save whatever child got themselves into whatever mess the game chose for them. But as you can see, this is a horror game after all, so just running around stage to stage completing puzzles isn't always going to be the name of the game. For you see, while you're safe during the daytime, free to explore areas and interact with NPCs to your heart's content, at night, this is where a lot more of the game's horror elements gets introduced. Firstly, the whole goal is to not get grabbed by your vor-loving father, so in order to do this, you're going to need to avoid him at all costs. 
And how you do this is by simply listening carefully during the nights because you'll hear all sorts of different stuff like doors opening, footsteps, you know, all sorts of shit like that. But when you accidentally fuck up and he sees you, this is where you need to start acting like you're the biggest Sonic fan and book your ass out of there as quickly as possible. But don't think that just running from room to room is going to be enough to get your ass away from the rabbit. No, you're going to need to find a place to hide, each of which comes with its own different mini game that you're going to need to complete in order to successfully avoid capture. Like climbing into a closet, you need to shift yourself from the rabbit's view so you don't get seen. If you hide in chests, you need to swat away spiders, same if you hide in a vent. And if for whatever reason you think it's actually a good idea to hide from your pursuer in the same thing that gives you a game over screen in previous games, you just need to hold your breath until this prick decides he's seen enough. One of the most unreliable hiding places though are under tables, because unless you were able to hide underneath them while the rabbit was like two rooms behind you, more often than not, this hiding spot is just more of a way for you to stun the guy, giving you a huge burst of speed so you can book it to a better hiding spot. But hiding under the tables tends to come with a huge caveat. After you complete Jeff's quest, if sending a sixth grader out to an abandoned mill in a shithole town all on his own seemed like a tad bit cruel, he at the very least gives you a flashlight for your troubles. This is where one of the game's primary sources of survival horror comes into the picture. You see, at random points during the night at the pizzeria, the lights will just randomly shut off, forcing you to need to restart them at the breaker box over here. And in these moments, you're going to need to use your flashlight in order to light your way. Or if you actually know what the layout of the place is, this flashlight is going to mean as much to you as a contestant in a Mr. Beast video. But you're going to need to use the flashlight in order to stun the rabbit when you hide under the tables, because this is the only way you're going to be able to stun him when things go to shit. But why this doesn't always work is that in order to keep your flashlight on, you're going to need to look both during the past and present for batteries, because if you don't have any when he decides to look under the table, Yeah, that's a no-no if you couldn't tell. And the other thing that I feel like I should mention, but I just decided to leave it for last because I, for the life of me, didn't really pay all too much attention to it, is the sound meter here at the bottom right-hand side of the screen. Yes, much like how you're able to hear the rabbit skulking around the pizzeria and in your house, he can also hear you. And by doing certain things like running, disturbing certain other characters I'll get to in just a bit, and interacting with certain objects, you can increase the noise meter. And I guess I don't need to explain this to you, but the louder you are, the more likely the rabbit is going to know where to find you. But you're also able to use that to your advantage by interacting with other objects in the environment, so you're able to lure him to a different room. But this aspect kind of feels a little bit undercooked, because I was sprinting all over the place and that didn't really seem to do all that much to create enough noise that would cause the rabbit to find me. But if you've also paid attention to what I just said, you'll also notice that I mentioned you can also raise the noise meter by disturbing other characters. Yes, as the nights progress, you're going to run into the other animatronics electronics during the night, all of which you're going to need to first get by through completing a puzzle. And all of them seem to be more of a threat in concept only. Chica just basically acts like a loud bitch luring the rabbit to wherever you are, Bonnie being the only other threat aside from the rabbit that can kill you if you fuck up his minigame when you get caught by him, and Freddy... I, I genuinely can't remember at all. I think he forgets the series is named after him. So yeah, basically they just act as little nuisances you need to avoid so that you don't get caught by the rabbit. Pretty basic shit. But now that I've discussed everything regarding the gameplay loop, let's head back to the plot again, shall we? Spoiler warning again, I guess. Now after surviving four days and nights, on the fifth night, Oswald has finally had enough of the rabbit shit and decide that he wants his dad back. So after returning to the pizzeria and saving yet another child, Oswald is finally able to locate his dad, who seems in pretty rough shape. So after freeing him, the rabbit comes in and grabs his dad, and after pursuing them, we see that he's busy attacking his dad by the ball pit. After one minigame where Oswald beats the fuck out of the rabbit, he pulls himself and his dad through the ball pit back to the current time. And after reuniting with his father, Oswald gets pulled back through the ball pit, captured and tied up by the rabbit, and then the game ends. What? Did you expect there to be a happy ending? Well, you'd be right. Much like any other good horror game, FNAF Into the Pit contains a bunch of alternate endings. The one that I originally got being, I'd assume, either the second or first bad ending, because there's even an ending where you can run through the entrance during the night and you can just say to hell with your dad and just leave. I even got an achievement for that. Ain't I special? But there are three other endings you're able to get, only one of which I was able to achieve being the good ending, where you make it out with your dad and he decides it's probably for the best that you guys move from the shithole, much to the inconvenience 
convenience of their grandmother. But also getting this ending makes the goat of the game Jeff get killed by the rabbit. And then a true ending which is more in line with the book, where both Oswald and his dad being reunited, but Oswald actually being grateful for what he has and just wants to enjoy the time he has with his dad, despite the circumstances that they live in. And another bad ending where Oswald himself gets infected. Now I didn't get that ending or the true ending because just like any good old fashioned FNAF game, you're going to need to complete a shit ton of mini games and phone a hidden number in order to get it. And maybe I will do that during a live stream, but for now I've got so much other shit that I need to do, so I'm happy I was at the very least able to get three different endings. So with all of that stuff out of the way, I think it's time that I give you my very epic review of the game, so let's talk about all the positives and negatives. Now as the title of this video might have given away, there's definitely a lot more positive than negative I have to say about this game, so let me get those out of the way real quick. Firstly, and this might be personal bias, but this is my video, so shut the hell up, I absolutely love the pixel art style of the game. Everything is just so stylized, it's going to ensure that this game is going to stand a test of time for many years to come. And even things like the menus being in more of a sketchbook style perfectly contrasts with the visuals of the main game. And couple that with the animations from when you get Vor and also the few cutscenes that the game has where you just get to see events taking place from Oswald's eyes is just fucking six stars, man. I love it. Secondly, I just really love the way how the game expands the world outside of the main horror events from the game. It's just nice to see you know, a world outside of the pizzeria, see other characters that have their own unique things to say, and also follow a main character that's plot just isn't fully cemented with Freddy Fazbear, and we actually get to see how his life is, his personality, his relationships with other characters in school and with his own family. There's a lot more depth here, and it's pretty damn good to follow along with an actual simple story, rather than the jumbled clusterfuck that the franchise's overall continuity is nowadays. Another thing that I absolutely adore is how they pretty much nailed the atmosphere that the original games had. When you're inside your house or at the pizzeria, you hear nothing except your character and the pursuer's footsteps, the buzz from whatever lights are still on, and all sorts of other different ambient noises. And not only that, when the game's music really picks up when you're in a chase scene, it's literally akin to games like Silent Hill, where someone just went to town on FL Studio while at a construction site. It's amazing. And there's also some auditory mindfuckery that's also included to fuck with the player. Like the ones that I noticed the most is just a baby crying. That noise has got nothing to do with the main rescuing of the kids, but on your first playthrough, you're not going to know that. How do we know how far this rabbit is willing to push the ESRB's buttons to shock you? And sometimes this atmosphere can bleed over to the visuals, because during key story moments and sometimes during gameplay, the game will just randomly cut to grotesque scenes of the animatronics during the daytime, making you really see what a toll this is having on Oswald's psyche. And during the nighttime, you'll even get these jump scare moments and some horrific images of the rabbit that'll just flash on screen for a split second to try and catch you off guard. Also, the choice to limit your control over the camera is also brilliant, because with the other animatronics wandering around the pizzeria in later nights, sometimes if you're completely careless, you might not know something's there until it's too late. Everything about this game's mechanics and overall atmosphere and sound is just brilliant. And given where FNAF went a couple of years back, I'm really glad to see that this is the direction they took with this game. But now, with all of the positives out of the way, time to farm hate views. Now, for as much praise as I give this game, I do feel that certain things that got introduced into the game that seemed like it'd play a pretty huge part in it is just completely undercooked, like the noise meter as well as the flashlight. Never during my entire playthrough have I ever made enough noise unless I used one of the noisemakers in the game, have I ever caused enough myself to get me into deep shit that caused me to try and be extra quiet. And the flashlight just became more of a defensive tool because when you know what the layout of each room is, then there's no real point in trying to illuminate your surroundings. Another thing that I really fucking hated in this game is how stingy some checkpoints ended up being. I noticed this mostly at the end of the game and when I tried replaying the game on a higher difficulty. Oftentimes when you fuck up, you aren't just started back in the ball pit room or any other location in the pizzeria. No, sometimes the game expects you to do an entire run back just to get back to where you were. Like in the end of the game. You can't obviously restart back at the ball pit room because of what happens in the story, but fucking hell, making me need to run all the way back from Oswald's house, pick the pizzeria, needing to interact with the door first so you can learn it's locked, talking to Jeff to get the key, and then running back to the room is just super annoying. And I think that might be one of my biggest complaints, but we're far 
far from done here, actually, because one of the biggest issues I've had with this game is that I just don't think it's all that scary. Now, I definitely have my praise for how well they were able to capture the horror atmosphere of the original games, but the game taking a more free roam approach to games like Outlast and even older style Resident Evil games, this game presented problems for itself I was extremely worried about and talked about in my FNAF 10 years later video. With the ability to freely roam around the map and can get yourself out of a pinch if you hide in a closet or whatever's closest to you, that leads to your pursuer's AI becoming extremely exploitable. Like in a few instances during my playthrough, if the prick just so happened to not be staring in my immediate direction, I could just follow him without him realizing I was there. So who's actually chasing who now, you pro? But aside from all those gripes that in all honesty could just be a me exclusive problem, the game just does everything else way too good for those things to be a major turnoff for me. So I gotta say, I 100% recommend that you go out and give Five Nights at Freddy's Into the Pit a go. And I gotta congratulate this seemingly random studio for pulling off something so well on their first go with this franchise. And hey, since this game was so good and it's based off of a series of books, why not let us see what Mega Cat can cook up with in the future by adapting some of the other entries in this series? But until we get to see that, try not to get bored. I think it's safe to say, as time marches forward, we all get old. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you're an old fuck like me, you'll know that time is just something that refuses to slow down. Some things might just seem like yesterday, when in reality that thing that you fondly remember turns out to have happened over a decade ago, making you wonder what the hell you've been doing with your entire life. And hopefully that segues us nicely into the topic of today's video. Because in order to get a greater understanding of how precious time actually is, we need to take our clocks and turn them all all the way back to 2014. It was the first year of the 8th generation of consoles, when memes still looked like this, Ubisoft's biggest falsely advertised game release, and was the year of a particular character who only by me showing you this silhouette should spark fond memories in the mind of anybody that sees it. Yes, can you fucking believe it, ladies and gentlemen? On this day or the day after, depending on when it would be the best time to upload this video to appease my corporate overlord, Five Nights at Freddy's was released released a whopping 10 years ago. It literally just seems like yesterday when Let's Player after Let's Player after Let's Player was covering this game. MatPat wasn't close to retiring at all, and the lore wasn't convoluted enough yet to cause Kojima to bust a nut. It's insane to think that this little point-and-click horror game where a bunch of PNGs and GIFs jump scare you with loud noises left such a humongous impact. And that actually got me thinking. Yeah! In a way, Five Nights at Freddy's had a humongous impact on both horror gaming as well as pop culture. And since this is the funny or 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 bear's 10th birthday, the perfect age where certain YouTubers will start taking notice, I think it's time for us to take a stroll back through memory lane and talk about the impact that Five Nights at Freddy's had on gaming 10 years later. But before all of that, here's an intro. Now I'm sure everybody should probably know the humble beginnings to this furry bait animatronic, but since I'm a YouTuber who likes milking people of all their watch time like Cell's first appearance in Dragon Ball Z, I think it's only appropriate to see how such a small project that would inevitably have such a large impact got its start. And in order to do that, we need to talk about one man. Scott Cawthon. Besides being the one to tell MatPat none of his theories were right, he started off his game development career by developing games to an audience primarily outside of what we know him for today. Early games of his dating all the way back to 2012, and this includes stuff like Pilgrim's Progress and The Desolate Hope. And whilst these two projects were generally well received, in Scott's own words, they weren't enough to financially support his family. One year later, Scott submitted another game that I think you'll be a little bit more familiar with to Steam Greenlight, and that was 
Chip Prince Sons Lumber Company, a resource management game with characters that would spark nightmares into the most battle-hardened soldiers. So much so to the point that I think this is what the game was the most notable for. I myself have never really played this game and I'm not really sure if I want to. Not just because I'm already a little bitch from playing his later games, but I'm just not the biggest fan of resource collecting games. The only exception to this rule I have is stuff like Minecraft and on the occasion Rust, if I want to be called a good slur every once in a while. And I'm not entirely sure what the game's overall reception was back then when it launched, but if going off from what I've read on Wikipedia, I don't really think reception was all too positive, and reading further on what said reception did to Scott's mental health, it sure seemed to take a toll on the guy. But after taking Chipper and Son's criticism to heart, Scott decided to steer his new game in a different direction, and on the 15th of June 2014, we got our first sneak peek at gaming history. Yes, everybody, welcome to the earliest footage we got to see of Five Nights at Freddy's. And what better way to start the trailer than the man himself, FNAF Freddy Bear. This 34 second trailer is pretty much now immortalized in the video game Hall of Fame. And this trailer was already a great sign of things to come. We got to see Fur Affinity's biggest mascot greet an applauding crowd of children, followed by the text, during the day, it's a place of joy, followed then by us seeing the rest of the crew with Chica and Bonnie, and then the most ominous message it shows up directly after, but you aren't here during the day. <laughs> then we switch through different cameras showing this Chuck E. Cheese inspired location during the evening, followed by us having the night watch. Well, no shit. Your previous text card already spoiled that. After that, we switched back to a close-up of the animatronics. I mean, makes sense. We don't want people making off with these finely crafted mechanical wonders. Oh, I seem to have drawn their attention. Then afterwards, we get the tags to this game. Limited power, limited visibility, and most importantly, limited time. Sounds like the average living experience in South Africa. Oh, and I forgot to mention that we at the very least also get to see Bonnie wandering the hallways at night and decide to get extremely close and intimate with whatever camera this is supposed to be. Don't know why he's so special in this trailer because this game isn't even named after him. But in any case, after all of that, we finally get the reveal of the game's title, Five Nights at Freddy's. Now, I will admit that this is a trailer of all time. I mean, it does everything that you need it to. It doesn't show you gameplay for starters, so it's following the traditional standards of the time, but it did definitely set a mood and atmosphere perfectly without really showing you a whole lot and leaving shit up to an interpretation. It's kind of like how the game's lore is nowadays if you really think about it. But I need to preface something here real quick. I, like many others, got introduced to FNAF through I am a, a fish. fish. So I'm genuinely curious to hear from those when the game's initial hype wave was originally circulating. Was this trailer enough to sell you on this game alone? Because I can't help but look at this trailer from the perspective of when this game was released and would think to myself that this would genuinely be something to keep an eye on. The only reason I can guarantee you people look back on this trailer fondly nowadays is that, you know, it's the first FNAF games trailer, knowing obviously how big the franchise became after this. But looking at it before FNAF actually released, I just really really want to know, did this catch the eyes of anybody back in the day? I know I'm getting sidetracked, but this is just really something I'm curious to learn about. In any case, Scott spent a total of six months developing the game, with friends and family serving as game beta testers. He made the game using Click Team Fusion 2.5 and used Autodesk 3DS Max to model 3D graphics. The game's sound was also produced by Scott using a bunch of sound effects he created himself, as well as some sounds that he found on the internet. The most notable one being the jump scare noise for when you have no choice but to succumb to a war fetish. For those of you who didn't know, the animatronics' beautiful pipes were originally uttered by actress Judy Geeson in the 1981 film Inseminoid. And if you're wondering why this poster as well as this scene is heavily blurred, you're an adult, look that shit up for yourself. I like having my YouTube channel. But regardless, after that six month development period was over, on August 8th, 2014, the game released into the world and would change indie horror games forever. 
actually know. I don't actually think FNAF changed gaming on the date of its release, but a whopping four days later, I think it finally made its splash thanks to the help of one certain individual. And thus Five Nights at Freddy's became an overnight sensation. Let's play video after let's play video after let's play video Not after. During the period of this game's release and still to this day, you can't escape FNAF. This Charlie Chaplin hat wearing fuck literally became an icon among the gaming sphere overnight. Everything from its franchise getting more and more games to fan animations to fan songs to fan cosplay to fan art to books and even most recently a feature length film with a sequel currently in development. Five Nights at Freddy's is no longer just a small little indie project that was developed by one single person but is now one of the faces of indie gaming and fuck even horror gaming in general you just genuinely can't escape it and all of that started with the release of the original back in 2014. So now as I tend to like doing in these videos where do I come into the picture with all of this? I realize that I've spoken a lot about my personal history with a lot of games, almost at a point where if I yapped long enough, I might accidentally end up doxing myself. But would you believe me that I didn't really experience Five Nights at Freddy's for myself until an entire year later, and even when I did, it wasn't even with the first game in the franchise. Now I understand I might have yapped some blasphemy to everybody right now, but it's the truth. So allow me to explain to you where I was during that time. Now you see, I live in South Africa, and I don't really live in a town that we we can call the most technically gifted. It's so bad to the fact that would you believe that we're only just now in 2024 getting fiber internet. As a person who primarily works from home and kind of relies on internet in order to do his job, I'm extremely fucking offended. And during this time, we used to work off of mobile data bundles my dad would get each month for his job. And at the end of each month, I was allowed to splurge the rest of whatever data we still had left on whatever I liked. So most of the time it would be on sites like YouTube. YouTube, because would you also believe that I haven't even known about YouTube until 2013 and wouldn't be a regular user of it until 2015. Yeah, I can totally understand that this is probably a sad story for all of you to hear. So while I have your sympathy, why not buy into my newly created long coin? Because together we can become the next biggest crypto. Regardless, it wasn't all that bad. I actually get a good amount of YouTube time off of the two gigabytes of data we used to have. And I believe that this was around the time where my first first exposure to FNAF manifested itself, because I distinctly remember lying in one of our guest bedrooms on my phone using some of that data and coming across Markiplier's video and just seeing that all caps title, WARNING, SCARIEST GAME IN YEARS, I WAS INSTANTLY HOOKED. But here's another sidetrack for everybody. Now you see, around this time, I was probably like around 15 years old, and I thought during this time, I was pretty hot shit. I'd already played all of the at the time scariest games, like Resident Evil, Condemned Criminal Origins, and Alien Isolation, and I didn't really think any of them were all that scary despite the popular opinion of them around the time. So a game where you get primarily jump scared by disgruntled employees in fursuits seemed like only something that pussies would be scared of, right? But little did I know that the only pussy in this situation was me and I Mr. am a fish. fish. Because just from watching him play the game on my tiny little Samsung Galaxy Pocket, the game's atmosphere just oozed out of the screen. And when that legendary moment came when Foxy jumped at the end of the video, that was probably the first time in ages that I got scared at a game. And after watching that video and experiencing something like that firsthand, I needed to learn more. So I loaded up 2014 Wikipedia and read up on the game, and I shit you not, the entire plot synopsis section was enough to scare the living shit out of me. Yes, black text on a white background was enough to cause me to urinate. I was weak. But after that, we now head on over to 2015. And during this time, I got myself one of these Blackberry phones, which were all the rage around the time when I was in high school. Because this little tiny phone had a service that allowed you to connect to the internet with uncapped internet for a fucking cheap price. And it was all thanks to this service that I was more capable of engaging with YouTube videos, and like most people during my age, I was stuck non-stop watching FNAF videos, whether it be the king himself Markiplier, to Jack 
Jacksepticeye to PewDiePie to even these pricks who wanted to copyright her work. But still, despite how invested I was in the series, I was still yet to play a single one of them. And then not too long afterwards, Scott would release the third game in the franchise, and this would be the one where I finally popped my FNAF cherry. And unlike most people going through an experience like that, I can at the very least say I didn't regret it. Or maybe I actually did. But oh my goodness, I fucking loved the third game. Everything from its creepy atmosphere to the micromanagement to not let your schizophrenic machination scare the living shit out of you. It was all just so damn good. And FNAF 3 still to this day remains one of my favorite games in the franchise. And not too long after my experience with the third game, in the same year, one of my buddies actually got the second game on his laptop, and we played a little bit of it at my house over the weekend. And once we got our shit rocked the second night, and probably also soiled our clean pants, I can distinctly remember him packing up to leave for home, and me practically begging him to stay because I was terrified of being left alone after what we just played. Yes, keep all of that in mind. I'm a little bitch when it comes to FNAF, but let me get my head sawed off in the evil within? I refuse to flinch. And we also pretty much had a blast with the second game. I think out of the entire series, it's definitely the hardest one, but fuck, I still think that it did every single thing that it needed to, and it was a damn good time. And with the second and third games coming out so close to one another, with a fourth one following pretty soon, it's just safe to say that the FNAF hype was just never done. But still, I had yet to play the original game, and this is where my memory gets a little bit too fuzzy. I actually can't remember when I ended up playing the first game. Did I play it before the fourth game, or did I play it afterwards? That entire part of my FNAF journey is just buried somewhere in the dark recesses of my mind, never to be found again. I do recall playing it though, and that it was the first one in the entire franchise that I ever beat, alongside the third game. Yes, two I still have to beat, four I can go my entire life without beating for fear of losing said life, and the rest for equally John as a little bitch boy reasons. And now I think about it, except for Security Breach, I just genuinely keep getting too busy to finish it. But that's enough reminiscing for now, because after all of this yapping, I finally get to talk about the actual game. So you know, let's just jump back to 2014 and see what made FNAF become such an industry icon in the first place. Yes, I am 100% sure that this menu and those sounds alone was enough to send nostalgic shivers down your spine. Or the sight of Freddy Fazbear made you giggle just a tiny little bit because of the fact that there is damning video evidence that proves that he's an interpretive dancer. Any case, ladies and gentlemen, here we are. The, the main menu. The one main menu that started it all, mind you. There's the title. There's our two options that will later become three. There's the analog horror green screen overlay effect. And there's a character that I'm pretty sure a few of you have a very special folder for on your PC. This is where it all began. And upon clicking that new game button, this is where the fun finally begins. We get that ever so iconic newspaper article where Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria is looking for somebody to work the night shift. And and after that, here we finally go. Night one. We get that ever so iconic view of the office that started it all. We boop the FNAF bear's nose because funny. And then we get a call from the man himself. Hello? Hello? Uh, I wanted to record a message for SHUT you. THE FUCK UP! So yes, as I'm sure I don't need to explain to anybody at this point, but this is a plain and simple point and click game. We get to look left. And then we get to look right, interact with these two buttons on each side of the room, one turning on the light in the hallway, and the other one closing a security door that could stop riots at Guantanamo Bay. And if we hover our mouse over to this little tab here, we can bring up this pretty advanced little tablet for the 1990s, and it's from here where we're able to select between the different cameras around the pizzeria. And it's at this point, best of luck everybody, you're going to need it. Now for the uninitiated, what does one do in FNAF 1? Well. For starters, hopefully not get bored and stuffed into a suit that has the same amount of space in it as my fucking first apartment. Yes, in FNAF 1, the objective is simple. 
survive. And to do said surviving, you're going to need to make it until 6 a.m. Only to repeat the cycle the following day, and that's pretty much it. You can't move from your tiny little office, even though that makes me question the mental stability of your main character, that he thinks that staying in this tiny little office while seven foot tall fursuits are out to get him is a smart idea, but I digress. So in order to not get your ass handed to you, you're going to need to keep track of where each of these animatronics are throughout the pizzeria, and you obviously need to utilize the cameras in order to do that. But in case you haven't noticed, this isn't exactly a fully 3D RTX level game we're playing over here. No, these are but mere little PNGs that we're staring at. So don't think that you're going to have real-time information fed to you so you can keep track of these animatronics. No, uh When they decide that being stuck in the broom closet isn't a fun idea anymore, they'll launch an EMP to momentarily blind the cameras so that they have ample time to relocate to a different area, which in turn means you're going to have to be frantically switching between all the cameras just to find out where the hell they are. Now you have a total of 11 cameras that you can sift through, but the most important ones are going to be the four closest to you, because it's over here where you need to start keeping an eye out for whatever animatronic is closest to you, because if they get too close... Yeah, no, you're gonna need to be as quick on your mouse to close that fucking door like you're a CSGO esports player. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking to yourselves. Okay, why can't I just keep the doors closed throughout the entire night? It just seems like that's the safest thing to do. Well then, you would be correct in that assumption, but since this is a horror game, things can't ever be that simple, now can it? Because as you can see here at the bottom left hand of your screen, you have two bars. One that shows how much power you have left, and another one that shows the amount of power you're currently using. Now, if you're a horror connoisseur like yours truly, then I'm pretty sure that I don't need to explain, but for the filthy casuals out there, every single thing that you do consumes power. Using the cameras, turning on the hallway lights, closing the door, leaving the fucking fan on on your desk, you know, you get the picture. Meaning that sure, you can leave the doors closed throughout the entire night, but would you have enough power to last you for the full six hours? Chances are probably not. And if you were a little bit greedy by using up every single a little bit of power before you clock off from work, well, I have some bad news for you. Could you tell that that's not what's supposed to happen? Yes, enough dilly-dallying. Let me go into a bit more detail as to what goes on in FNAF. Each night starts at midnight, and the goal is to make it all the way to 6 a.m. And within that time, you need to keep an eye out for one of the four animatronics, namely Bonnie, Chica, Freddy, and Foxy. You already know who they are. Each of them behave in their own different ways. Bonnie will wander around the pizzeria and will normally approach from the left-hand side of the screen, and Chica will do the exact same thing, but will always show up on the right hand side of the screen. Freddy does whatever the fuck he feels like, and Foxy is a little prick. Now, I should clarify that the footage that you're seeing here is from my playthrough I recorded for this video, and for a majority of it, I didn't really get an encounter from Foxy once. Reason for that being is because if you know how to cheese this game, it can get quite fucking easy. But how Foxy usually acts is like so. Foxy's main area is on Cam 1C at Pirate Cove. First off, the curtains will remain closed so that you can't see him. Then, as the night progresses, he'll start making his presence known, and if you're not good at keeping an eye on him, motherfucker will make a mad dash to the left-hand side of the map, meaning that you've got seconds to close that door on him before he comes for your booty. And judging how the fan base of this game is, I think that phrase holds two different meanings. Sometimes you're even able on rare occasions to get a jump scare from Golden Freddy, and the oh-so-iconic It's Me flashes on screen, which I thankfully don't have to go into too much detail on here as to what they mean, because thankfully there's millions of other channels that can do that for me. I think the proper term for this is called network. And you need to survive all these trials and tribulations while making sure that you still at the very least have enough power to last you up until 6am. Otherwise, hearing the Tripador's march is going to be something that you're gonna need to bring up to your therapist as to why you refuse to attend operas. But thankfully though, not all is lost. You see, I'm not sure how the countdown timer works in FNAF, but I'm pretty sure it works on a fixed time. And that also plays into the whole randomness nature of the game. The clock is always going down constantly, so that even if you end up fucking up your power consumption, if you were 
literally 10 seconds off from beating the knight and the power still dies, you'll still be able to make it to the next knight. And let me tell you, the satisfaction by just being able to scrape by a knight at the last possible moment is almost comparable to beating a level 1 enemy in a souls-like. And if you've been paying attention to what I've just said, then that one single word is actually what defines the tenseness factor to FNAF's overall horror. Randomness. Everything in this game is randomized. It's also quite cheesable if you know how to do it, but everything from whomever decides to piss off from the main stage first, to where they'll show up on the cameras, to who'll show up at your door first is all randomized, making it almost near impossible to be able to tell where each animatronic is. Now, there is a level to each of these animatronics, though, that increases as the nights go on. And early spoiler, when you beat the game, this is a level that you can tweak to your heart's content, or do the funny cheat code. <laughs> I'm not sorry. And this level, I'm just gonna say, has an impact on the overall animatronic's aggressiveness, meaning how frequently they'll be darting around the pizzeria, how frequently they'll show up at your door to check up on your car's extended warranty, and all sorts of stuff like that. And couple that with the sheer randomness that FNAF contains, you'll be flipping around characters and jolting your head left and right like you're busy taking a driver's test. Now, the only two factors that I'm not 100% sure on is when Freddy himself and Golden Freddy will show up. Fuck, if I'm going off of memory alone, I think Freddy can only be spotted in one of the cameras. And when he decides to jump scare your ass, I don't really think there's any way to counter that. But now that I've talked about the game's overall experience, allow me to shift focus from the gameplay and over to the game's presentation. I mean... They are very nice looking JPEGs. Every single frame of this game is iconic. Whether you're looking at the main stage with all the animatronics, Foxy peeking through the curtains in Pirate Cove, or seeing the eerie sights of Bonnie and Chica just standing right outside your office door. Every single frame oozes with tension, ripe for Luna AI exploitation. Hell, there's even some catching off guard moments in these frames to add to the horror experience. Like this one, for example, when you're looking in the parts and service room, you can sometimes catch a frame where these disembodied heads just stare at you. The same applies with Freddy on the main stage. Sometimes he'll look off to the side as if though he's schizophrenic, and sometimes he'll remember to take his meds and realize that someone's always watching. I love tiny little details like these that just adds to the game's overall horror atmosphere, because it can momentarily distract you from what you were busy doing so that you can confirm that what you saw was actually real. And moving over from all those random occurrences, this might be one of the first examples that I can think of of a game using liminal spaces to set an uneasy atmosphere to disturb the player. Because come on, as we all know FNAF was primarily inspired by Chuck E. Cheese, and you just tell me that locations like these didn't creep you out like a motherfucker even when they were brightly lit during the day, let alone after hours. A sense of the familiarity with environments like these, coupled up with the messed up stuff that happens in this game, <coughs> is the perfect recipe for an excellent setting. Now, as a game that came out in 2014, FNAF 1 does kind of have a few rough edges if you just want to play the game vanilla nowadays. For starters, you guys have been seeing the game properly stretched to a full screen resolution, but for me, I was primarily looking at it through OBS like this. Yes, since this was a game that released all the way back in 2014, and it being an indie product, it playing at 1080p around the time isn't really something that should be expected. I mean, the game still played at the proper full screen while I was playing it, so that's a plus at the very least. But that does doesn't excuse one of the biggest issues with the game if you choose to play it nowadays. This issue, in fact, caused me a few times to fumble up a night and caused me more unnecessary stress and panic than it should have. You see, the game does play at a full screen resolution of 720p, but the problem with this is that the game isn't locked to an exclusive full screen. What does that mean exactly? Well, if you just choose to go willy-nilly with your mouse, it tends to veer off to the side onto your other monitor if you have one, and if you click off the game, it turns your screen black for a few seconds because because you're no doubt playing this on a higher resolution monitor, and it'll take a few seconds for your screen to readjust itself. And you might be thinking to yourself, that doesn't sound like too big of a problem. And I agree with you. This wouldn't be as huge of a pain in the ass if it wasn't for the fact that FNAF doesn't have a pause feature. Yes, much like the Souls games that I'm no doubt sure FNAF was inspired by, every single night needs to be completed in one sitting. Because either you wait it out and hope you're not going to be the thing they'll be serving on the next day's menu, or you just have to quit out of the current night you're in, forcing you to need to restart when you want to come back. This little tiny issue led me to needing to be extra locked in while I was playing this, like a crack addict that was busy heading into relapse. Because with my cheese method, it needed me to be extra focused on not missing a single button, so I basically needed to have the reflexes of a Sekiro sweat to keep my run going. But sometimes I messed up and went off screen, but then whoop, 
Oops, I actually get jump scared by my desktop. Then I have seconds to hurry myself back to the game before the worst could happen. This is kind of annoying if you couldn't tell. But at the same time, I'd argue that this somewhat helps with the game's horror. Because if you fuck up and veer off screen because of carelessness, that adds even more panic and tension because when you load it back in, you might just accidentally return the moment you get jump scared, probably causing you to commit a little bit of brown or yellow. As for everything else though, I think for what this game is, and for everything that it does with the limitations of the engine that it was released on, I think that this game is one of the examples of a perfect horror game. Everything from it sounds messing with you, like playing Foxy's stupid laugh, the footsteps that for a fact isn't your super glued ass, gives you so much auditory confusion because you don't know what any of them could mean. Do the footsteps mean they're right outside your door, or could that mean they've just moved to another location on the map? Well, you wouldn't be able to know unless you shift focus your cameras and away from your two big ass doors. Also, the whole idea of limiting your item use to a finite amount of energy I also think was a brilliant choice, because every single thing you do requires a level of thought that harkens back to older style of survival horror games where you need to use whatever resources you had sparingly. And even if you're the most efficient with the uses of your doors, camera, that fucking fan that I swear pulls about 45% of the building's power at night, with the absolute randomness and aggressiveness of the animatronics in the following nights, it'll sometimes force you to have to use more resources than you're comfortable with. Like in my case when both Bonnie and Chica showed up at my doors and they wouldn't fuck off causing me to waste even more of my power, but still needing to keep my eye out for Freddy and Foxy. And the sheer panic I felt when shit like that happened was enough for me to pucker my asshole so tight I was able to fold inside out. And even when I was completely locked in and focused on not trying to get my ass handed to me, I was trembling like a little bitch because one small slip up could spell doom for me. And I just can't say that I've ever played a horror game or game in general that had such a humongous impact on me. Fuck, even games like Outlast or Alien Isolation Games that are way more in line with what people consider to be proper survival horror games couldn't even nearly get me to the same amount of fear and tension that FNAF brought me. And couple that with some of the what the hell was that moments I previously mentioned like with Golden Freddy and the it's me shit, it causes more than enough panic to make you slightly not focus on the real issue at hand. And the fact that the game was able to do all of that whilst looking like one of those pop cap look for the hairbrush in the home of a hoarder games speaks volumes for how well Scott was able to craft a terrifying act atmosphere with such large limitations. But that also brings us to what a lot of people consider to be one of the game's biggest letdowns. It's just a bunch of PNGs that scream loud noises at you. And yes, you can't really give FNAF all that much praise when the criticism towards the games are pretty valid. Yes, all you're doing is sitting your ass down in one spot, flipping through a bunch of Windows XP wallpapers with the occasional furry dot PNG popping up in them. And if you mess up, a dot gif file jumps up at you with an extremely loud dot mp3 file. These criticisms are kind of valid, but I think people are missing the entire point when you look at the game through that point of view. Yes, it's not a fully 3D open map you can freely explore and play hide and seek from a bunch of con goers by hiding underneath a table or hiding in a closet. Yes, when you look at a game like that, this game isn't really all that special. But you tell me that if the first FNAF played in the same vein as something like Outlast, do you think that this game would work out nearly as well? Would going through five or six different nights in the same map with possibly more exploitable AI really hit the same way? I think that kind of novelty would run dry real quick quick after like the fourth night, and I guarantee that if FNAF went in that direction, it would have quickly aged like a motherfucker, lessening the game's overall impact that it had. Because I feel like if it released in such a state, it would have just been considered a watered down Outlast clone. I think the switch to a more point and click style was the best move, because not only will the gameplay style probably age the best in terms of accessibility, but everything will just age the best in terms of its visuals and atmosphere because of it being a more stylistic choice. And like I've said, some of the flaws that this game still has nowadays Days causes it to have even more of a fear factor, so I'd almost argue that it aged even better with time. One of the other things I remember hearing about this game that makes total sense to me is that in FNAF, it's not the jump scare itself that scares the shit out of you, but it's the anticipation of it. And I think that's absolutely true. Humanity's biggest fear is the fear of the unknown, and going into this game with the mindset knowing that you're going to get jump scare, knowing that with one wrong move and you're fucked, but not knowing exactly when it's going to happen, is one of the key 
causes of dread for this game. And this feeling remains consistent with the rest of the games in the franchise, except for you. So since this is a super cool IGN level review part of the video, I 100% can still recommend that you pick up the first FNAF game. It's aged pretty damn well. And if you have two monitors, it's even better because you're gonna have to make sure that you don't accidentally click off of the game because the next thing you might see when you load back into the game is the same thing a doctor sees when they ask you to say ah. But now that we know what FNAF is and how good the actual game is, it didn't just stop there because this game sent shockwaves not throughout the gaming industry but in pop culture in general. And to look at FNAF's initial impact, we need to go to the one place that sparked its mainstream popularity. Now, as I'm sure we all should know by this point, YouTube in 2014 was a completely different place back then. It was a time when just popping on bandy cam and filming yourself playing Minecraft with a calm demeanor was more commonplace rather than the ear-piercing ADHD fuel we're used to nowadays. It was a time dominated by Let's Plays and gaming montages and an era before every single big YouTuber was getting out of this nonsense almost once every single month. And it was during this time that Let's Plays got a humongous explosion thanks to one certain upload. And I don't I don't think I need to beat around the bush here. It's the one video that put both the game and its creator covering it on the map. On the 12th of August 2014, Markiplier would upload his first video on FNAF and then history was made. Everybody started covering this game in both Let's Plays, reviews, songs, animations, you fucking name it. FNAF broke out of the indie horror scene and pretty much into the mainstream almost instantly. And both sparked Scott's desire to continue with the franchise, but also sparked a lot of people's career when they decided to cover for now. It was just so fucking funny to go onto the internet back in the day and try to look for someone who was busy pissing themselves because of the funny bear. And obviously with such mainstream attention, of course that would almost instantly spell success for your game. Because if a YouTuber playing the game got close to like 100 million views on it, what do you think are the chances that at the very least 100,000 people chose to bite the bullet and buy the game for themselves? Either because they wanted something new to satiate their horror fix, they just wanted to see what all the hype was about, or to just make content for themselves, which in turn would expose them and the game they're covering to an even larger audience. And with Scott constantly pumping out sequel after sequel to this mega hit, that ensured both the success of his newly created franchise as well as the people who decided to cover it in their own way. But not only did this game pretty much cement FNAF as a part of gaming history, as I'm sure if you've been watching this channel for a while now, whenever something tastes even the slightest bit of success, especially to the degree that FNAF got, obviously other people would try to take their own spin on what Scott created a decade to go. As I'm sure you know, horror is a medium that existed for literally decades at this point. Whether you look back at the old monster movies Universal pumped out back in the 1920s, or if you want to let this video hit more close to home and stuff like video games, stuff like Resident Evil and Silent Hill, horror has pretty much been a mainstay in media for as long as film and video games have existed. Now, I'm not entirely sure what the take on horror games were by the time of FNAF's release, but I'm pretty sure that there was a bit of a drought. Mainstream horror franchises that were solely responsible for putting the genre on the map were busy rubbing shoulders with the degenerates of Call of Duty like Resident Evil. And other franchises seemed to deviate more and more from what made its genre so good to begin with. And it wasn't until games like Outlast and Amnesia were released that I think the interest in horror was sparked again. But oh boy, let me tell you, when FNAF released back in 2014, everybody wanted to ditch trying to make asset flip Unity engine games starring the Slender Man. Nah, everybody wanted to take their own spin on the point and click survival horror game. So why not load up something like Scratch, upload your creation onto Game Jolt, and get ready to see what YouTuber would pick it up and cover the game on their channels. And that's what happened to a few of these kinds of games. We had games like Five Nights at Wario's, more famously Five Nights at Sonic's, FNAF clones of course featuring the respective Mario and Sonic characters. There was Five Nights at Treasure Island, based on the abandoned by Disney creepypasta, Five Nights at the Krusty Krab, and many more taking inspiration from FNAF and bunging in characters from already existing franchises. But if getting a cease and desist order from both Disney and Nintendo Nintendo doesn't sound like a fun 
some time to you, then maybe you can take the FNAF formula and create your very own little universe. And that's what some people did with games like Five Nights at Candy's or One Night at Flumpty's. And hell, these games were so successful that they even spun off into their own franchises. Some people actually went out of their way to try and expand the already established FNAF formula in other ways, most notably with games like The Joy of Creation and Juniors, one of which took the FNAF formula and incorporated elements of free roam into the equation, making it more in line with other horror games that you're probably more familiar with. And Juniors looking like it plays a hell of a lot more into the paranormal aspects of these games. But I'm not going to go into all of these games in this video alone. There's a hell of a lot more YouTubers that are qualified to do that. And not to mention, there's also a fuck ton of these games that both contain content and figures behind them that I'd rather think I'd let Sunny V2 make a video on them. But regardless, if you needed a FNAF fix after playing through every single game in the franchise, somebody out there definitely had you covered. But not only did FNAF inspire so many different games based off of its formula, much like my take on Resident Evil 4 and how that game was indirectly responsible for what caused the franchise to go in a bit of an identity crisis, FNAF would also be the catalyst of a subgenre that I don't think it could ever have predicted and sadly fell into itself. And I'm sure if you've watched any video on YouTube covering this type of topic and even on my own channel, then you probably know what two words I'm about to utter. Mascot horror. Now for those of you who aren't all that clued up on your internet lore yet, you might ask yourself, the fuck is mascot horror? So basically the whole aspect of mascot horror is taking characters that kids normally would love and plunge them into the lake of rot to contort them into these terrible demons that for some reason a select few people on the internet would like to fornicate with. Sure, I think the entire idea of taking these normally cute characters and then turning them homicidal is a concept that existed way before even FNAF, but this concept has never been as popular then as it is now, and I think that FNAF indirectly had an influence on this type of horror. The most notable games in this subgenre being Bendy and the Ink Machine, Hello Neighbor, Poppy Playtime, Garden of Banban, -Ban, and the most recent addition being Indigo Park. But the biggest problem that this type of genre usually faces, with the exception of a few games on this list, is that a lot of these games focus a lot less on being good horror games, and more so as to how they can be cash cows for their audiences. Yes, whether it be games like Hello Neighbor, Poppy Playtime, or Garden of Banban, -Ban, a humongous part of these games' existence are more to sell merch, aside from just being good games, because they primarily depend on the recognizability of their main mascot from either the game or from whichever YouTuber covered it, and try to maximize the amount of profit by selling all sorts of shit kids would bankrupt their entire families for in an instant. Now like I said, there are a few exceptions to this rule because other games that can be classified as mascot horror, like Bendy and Indigo Park, don't really seem to fall under the overly monetized moniker. Sure, they do have merch, but I don't think they place as huge of an emphasis on it like let's say the devs behind Poppy Playtime, who if I need to remind you, actually went as far as to make fucking NFTs, so just let that shit sink in for a second. And the reason why I say that even FNAF itself wasn't really safe from the mascot horror plague, then we need not look further than 2021's Security Breach, one of the most broken, non-scary and basic horror games I think I've played in my entire life, that I 100% think lost what made FNAF so terrifying to begin with just because it wanted to jump on the mascot horror trend. Yes. The game itself is still fun when you're just taking the piss out of it, but I'm pretty sure that's not what Steel Wool Studio had in mind when they were making this. Thankfully though, with the release of FNAF Ruin as well as Help Wanted 2, it seems that they finally woke up and remembered what made FNAF so good to begin with, but fucking hell man, with how massive FNAF is, I wouldn't be surprised if they just doubled down and tried something similar again later down the line. But with all of that out of the way, I think it's time that we start wrapping this video up. Despite all my critiques on where FNAF went in the last part, like how it pretty much fed into the subgenre of mascot horror it indirectly helped create, that still doesn't change the fact that FNAF will go down as one of the most influential, not just indie games, but games in general. And it's safe to say that FNAF left a pretty massive impact on a lot of people, whether or not it just be YouTubers like Markiplier, MatPat, musicians and animators like The Living Tombstone and Pymation, but I think the most important impact that it left was on the fans that to this day still love these games. Everybody is at the very least going to have one fond memory about playing FNAF, whether they were just goofing off with a bunch of buddies or see who was going to 
piss themselves first when Foxy jumps out at them after seeing him run down the hallway. I'm sure everybody has at least one memory like that of playing FNAF for their first time. And like many games that have left an impact, this is a franchise that just means so much to so many different people. There's a reason people will spend hours upon hours upon hours discussing theories with other fans. There's a reason people will spend hours and hours drawing fan art and other kinds of arts of their favorite characters. There's reasons people will go to conventions with the most realistic looking Springtrap cosplay that I don't even think Hollywood would be able to recreate. And speaking of Hollywood, there's a reason that FNAF's mainstream success led to them even making a full feature length film. Because I don't think that besides maybe a game like Minecraft, there's been an indie game that has left such a huge impact on modern day pop culture like Five Nights at Freddy's. And I guess with more games and more stuff coming out as time moves forward, I don't think that FNAF is going to be losing steam anytime soon, and while it might not be as massive as it was back when it came out, I think it's safe to say that this was the impact left by Five Nights at Freddy's 10 years later.